Did you know that more than 70% of all immigrants to America in the 19th century entered through New York City, then known as the Golden Door, though for many the future that awaited them was anything but golden. In the 1800s, people from all over the world decided to leave their homes for the United States. Some fled crop failure, others unemployment, rising taxes, or starvation, believing the United States to be the country of economic opportunity. Between 1870 and 1900, almost 12 million immigrants entered the United States. The majority initially arrived from Germany, Ireland, and England. Later came Italians and Jewish people from Eastern Europe. From the start of the California Gold Rush in 1849 to 1882, when the Exclusion Act stopped their immigration, a sizable number of Chinese people also immigrated to the United States. Immigrants gravitated to their own communities, but found harsh living conditions, often in tenement slums on the Lower East Side where rents were cheaper. There were never enough jobs available, and those that could be found were low pay, and they were frequently exploited by employers in sweatshops. With so many people competing for work from different cultures, there was social conflict. Religious differences from the old countries fueled intolerance. Many experienced verbal and physical abuse due to stereotypes and discrimination against them because they were different, particularly so for the Irish and African Americans. Today, we learn about some of these cultural prejudices and how they changed over time as one community after another arrived, settled, often in the worst of the city's neighborhoods, before moving up in New York's social and political hierarchy, or moving out by heading west in search of prosperity. The account is told by Jacob Rees, 1849-1914, a Danish-American social reformer and photographer who made a significant contribution to the reform of living conditions in New York at the end of the 19th century. You will form your own opinion about his views on New York's immigrant communities, which sometimes appear to follow preconceived stereotypes prevalent in his era, telling its own story as to how social attitudes are both shaped and change with the passage of time. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. When once I asked the agent of a notorious Fourth Ward Alley how many people might be living in it, I was told 140 families, 100 Irish, 38 Italian, and two that spoke the German tongue. Barring the agent herself, there was not a native-born individual in the court. The answer was characteristic of the cosmopolitan character of Lower New York, very nearly so of the whole of it, wherever it runs to alleys and courts. One may find for the asking an Italian, a German, a French, African, Spanish, Bohemian, Russian, Scandinavian, Jewish, and Chinese colony. Even the Arab who peddles holy earth from the battery as a direct importation from Jerusalem has his exclusive preserves at the lower end of Washington Street. The one thing you shall vainly ask for in the chief city of America is a distinctively American community. There is none, certainly not among the tenements. Where have they gone to, the old inhabitants? I put the question to one who might fairly be presumed to be of the number, since I had found him sighing for the good old days, when the legend, no Irish need apply, was familiar in the advertising columns of the newspapers. He looked at me with a puzzled air. I don't know, he said. I wish I did. Some went to California in 49, some to the war and never came back. The rest, I expect, have gone to heaven, or somewhere. I don't see them round here. Whatever the merit of the man's conjectures, his eyes did not deceive him. They are not here. In their place has come this queer, conglomerate mass of heterogeneous elements, ever striving and working like whiskey and water in one glass, and with a like result, final union and a prevailing taint of whiskey. The once unwelcome Irishman has been followed in his turn by the Italian, the Russian Jew, and the Chinese man, and has himself taken a hand at opposition, quite as bitter and quite as ineffectual, against these later hordes. Wherever these have gone, they have crowded him out, possessing the block, the street, the ward, with their denser swarms. But the Irishman's revenge is complete. 
Victorious in defeat over his recent as over his more ancient foe, the one who opposed his coming no less than the one who drove him out, he dictates to both their politics, and, secure in possession of the offices, returns the native his greeting with interest, while collecting the rents of the Italian whose house he has bought with the profits of his saloon. As a landlord, he is picturesquely autocratic. An amusing instance of his methods came under my notice while writing these lines. An inspector of the health department found an Italian family paying a man with a Celtic name $25 a month for three small rooms in a ramshackle rear tenement, more than twice what they were worth, and expressed his astonishment to the tenant, an ignorant Sicilian labourer. He replied that he had once asked the landlord to reduce the rent, but he would not do it. "'Well, what did he say?' asked the inspector. "'That man,' he said, "'if you speak that way to me, I throw you and your things in the street.' And the frightened Italian paid the rent. In justice to the Irish landlord, it must be said that like an apt pupil he was merely showing forth the result of the schooling he had received re-enacting in his own way the scheme of the tenements. It is only his frankness that shocks. The Irishman does not naturally take kindly to tenement life, though with characteristic versatility he adapts himself to its conditions at once. It does violence nevertheless to the best that is in him, and for that very reason of all who come within its sphere soonest corrupts him. The result is a sediment the product of more than a generation in the city's slums, that, as distinguished from the larger body of his class, justly ranks at the foot of tenement dwellers, the so-called low Irish. It is not to be assumed, of course, that the whole body of the population living in the tenements, of which New Yorkers are in the habit of speaking vaguely as the poor, or even the larger part of it, is to be classed as vicious or as poor in the sense of verging on beggary. New York's wage-earners have no other place to live. More is the pity. They are truly poor for having no better homes, waxing poorer in purse as the exorbitant rents to which they are tied, as ever was surf to soil, keep rising. The wonder is that they are not all corrupted, and speedily, by their surroundings. If, on the contrary, there be a steady working up, if not out of the slough, the fact is a powerful argument for the optimist's belief that the world is, after all, growing better, not worse, and would go far toward disarming apprehension were it not for the steadier growth of the sediment of the slums and its constant menace. Such an impulse toward better things there certainly is. The German rag-picker of thirty years ago, quite as low in the scale as his Italian successor, is the thrifty tradesman or prosperous farmer of today. The Sheriff Street colony of rag-pickers, long since gone, is an instance in point. The thrifty German saved up money during years of hard work in squalor and apparently wretched poverty to buy a township in a western state, and the whole colony moved out there in a body. There need be no doubt about their thriving there. The Italian scavenger of our time is fast graduating into exclusive control of the corner fruit stands, while his boy monopolizes the boot-blacking industry in which a few years ago he was an intruder. The Irish hod carrier in the second generation has become a bricklayer, if not the older man of his ward, while the Chinese are in almost exclusive possession of the laundry business. The reason is obvious. The poorest immigrant comes here with the purpose and ambition to better himself and, given half a chance, might be reasonably expected to make the most of it, to the false plea that he prefers the squalid homes in which his kind are housed. There could be no better answer. The truth is, his half chance has too long been wanting, and for the bad result he has been unjustly blamed. As emigration from east to west follows the latitude, so does the foreign influx in New York distribute itself along certain well-defined lines that waver and break only under the stronger pressure of a more gregarious race or the encroachments of inexorable business, a feeling of dependence upon mutual effort, natural to strangers in a strange land, unacquainted with its language and customs, sufficiently accounts for this. The Irishman is the true cosmopolitan immigrant, all-pervading, he shares his lodging with perfect impartiality with the Italian, the Greek, and the Dutchman, yielding only to sheer force of numbers, and objects equally to them all. A map of the city coloured to designate nationalities would show more stripes than on the skin of a zebra, 
and more colours than any rainbow, the city on such a map would fall into two great halves, green for the Irish prevailing in the west side tenement districts, and blue for the Germans on the east side. But intermingled with these ground colours would be an odd variety of tints that would give the whole the appearance of an extraordinary crazy quilt. From down in the sixth ward, upon the site of the old collect pond that in the days of the fathers drained the hills which are no more, the red of the Italian would be seen forcing its way northward along the line of Mulberry Street to the quarter of the French purple on Bleecker Street and South Fifth Avenue to lose itself and reappear, after a lapse of miles, in the Little Italy of Harlem, east of Second Avenue. Dashes of red, sharply defined, would be seen strung through the annexed district, northward to the city line. On the west side, the red would be seen overrunning African Americans of Thompson Street, pushing up town against querulous but unavailing protests, occupying his home, his church, his trade and all, with merciless impartiality. There is a church in Mulberry Street that has stood for two generations as a sort of milestone of these migrations, built originally for the worship of staid New Yorkers of the old stock. Then African Americans came when the draft riots drove them out of reach of Cherry Street and the Five Points. Within the past decade, the advance wave of the Italian onset reached it, and today the arms of United Italy adorn its front. The African Americans have made a stand at several points along 7th and 8th Avenues, but their main body, still pursued by the Italian foe, is on the march yet, and can be found today in many blocks on the east side, with 100th Street as the centre, where colonies of them have settled recently. Hardly less aggressive than the Italian, the Russian and Polish Jew, having overrun the district between Rivington and Division Streets, east of the Bowery, to the point of suffocation, is filling the tenements of the old Seventh Ward to the riverfront, and disputing with the Italian every foot of available space in the back alleys of Mulberry Street. The two races, differing hopelessly in much, have this in common. They carry their slums with them, wherever they go, if allowed to do it. Little Italy already rivals its parent, the Bend, in foulness. Other nationalities that begin at the bottom make a fresh start when crowded up the ladder. Happily, both are manageable, the one by rabbinical, the other by the civil law. Between the dull grey of the Jew, his favourite colour, and the Italian red, would be seen squeezed in on the map a sharp streak of land, marking the narrow boundaries of Chinatown dovetailed in with the German population, the poor but thrifty Bohemian might be picked out by the sombre hue of his life as of his philosophy, struggling against heavy odds in the big human beehives of the east side. Colonies of his people extend northward, with long lapses of space, from below the Cooper Institute more than three miles. The Bohemian is the only foreigner with any considerable representation in the city who counts no wealthy man of his race, none who has not to work hard for a living or has got beyond the reach of the tenement. Down near the battery, the west side emerald, spreading rapidly like a splash of ink on a sheet of blotting paper, headquarters of the Arab tribe, that in a single year has swelled from the original dozen to twelve hundred, intent every mother's son on trade and barter. Dots and dashes of colour here and there would show where the Finnish sailors worship their Jumala, God. The Greek peddler is the ancient name of their race, and the Swiss the goddess of thrift. And so on to the end of the long register, all toiling together in the galling fetters of the tenement. Were the question raised, who makes the most of life thus mortgaged, who resists most stubbornly its levelling tendency, knows how to drag even the barracks upward a part of the way, at least toward the ideal plane of the home, the palm must be unhesitatingly awarded the Teuton. The Italian and the poor Jew rise only by compulsion. The Chinese man does not rise at all. Here, as at home, he simply remains stationary. The Irishman's genius runs to public affairs rather than domestic life. Wherever he is mustered in force, the saloon is the gorgeous centre of political activity. The German struggles vainly to learn his trick. His Teutonic wit is too heavy, and the political ladder he raises from his saloon, usually too short or too clumsy to reach the desired goal. 
The best part of his life is lived at home, and he makes himself a home independent of the surroundings, giving the lie to the saying, unhappily become a maxim of social truth, that pauperism and drunkenness naturally grow in the tenements. He makes the most of his tenement, and it should be added that whenever and as soon as he can save up money enough, he gets out and never crosses the threshold of one again.